yourselves. Fight amongst yourselves. Go ahead. How many of us? All right. Tough crowd. I know. Everybody's sick. Who wants sickness away? Give Jesus an amen. Come on. Sickness is gone. So here's what you got to do. Since that's the case, we got to start off today right as we kick off. She said, he said. You got to let two people know God loves you. Come on. God loves you. God loves you. No, God loves you. Hey, isn't that the best thing that we can share with anything who comes in our contact with us this week is let them know that God loves you? Now, nothing else. Even if they've got the winning lottery ticket, let them know God loves them because it's the best thing that we can share with anyone. And that's what we got to make clear as we walk through this series because we're going to kick off this series. Uh, we kind of started it a little bit last week. I enjoy it. So how many of us today would say our relationships aren't in the best place, Right. We say they're all together. As a matter of fact, we can say in our relationships right now, I don't think I would be reaching to say that we are more divided than ever before. We have put ourselves in camps, right? Excuse me. We put ourselves in some camps, right? And it's easier to celebrate the conflict than the compromise of reconciliation. Because there's something about it, honestly, isn't there just something about uh, being in conflict and feeling like you're right? But you see, Jesus didn't come and, and rise again for us to feel like we were right. He did to make us righteous. He did to set us free. And that's what we're going to be talking through. And so these next few weeks, we're going to have some fun with she said, he said, and we're going to have a little bit of boxing terms. So today, we're going to learn through this thing called the single, right? Now, whether you're single or not, it's not going to matter. It's, it's, it's perfect for all relationships. Next week, we're going to talk about the one, two. You know, you got to get them with a bop, bop, right? Like, you know, you got to get ready. Then the next is the combo. Man, when you get three or more, that's what we're going to have walking and kicking up here. I should have kicked. That's fine. There's a meme somewhere with it. But all the way through, right? All the way through, we're going to talk about that. So if you've got your Bible today, we're going to get there in a minute. I want to set this up because we're going to talk about the single, but not just single people, all right? Oh, I'm a single lady. Oh, no. Okay, we're good, yeah. That's the wrong hand, so if they put it on your right hand. Anyway, all the way through, we're going to talk about the single. So really quickly, you can look this up. Pew did a survey in September 2023, around September 14th, you can look this up. And they ask adults, when it comes to having a fulfilling life, what is very important? 71% of them said it's important to have a job that you enjoy and that you like. 71%. 61% said that having a fulfilling life, it's very important to have a close friend or a good friend. 26% said having a fulfilling life means that you have to have children. And 23% said to have a fulfilling life, it means that we have to be married. Now, some of those numbers we can go back and forth with, but it should come no surprise that at least the vast majority of us know that we have to be in right relationships to have a fulfilling life. 61% of people believe that. And for us, those of us who are Christians, it should come as no surprise because we know that we are wired for relationships, are we not? Like God created us to be in right relationship with him from the beginning until we decided that we knew better, that our relationship with something else meant more than our relationship with him which broke our relationship with each other. From the foundations of the earth, Genesis 1 talks about this, from the foundations, how we can be in right relationship with God. We were created to be in right relationship. Then this dysfunction of sin came along, and the forbidden fruit was eaten, and the forbidden fruit was asparagus. You're welcome. Whatever that is. And we decided the forbidden fruit was actually us thinking that we knew better about how to conduct ourselves with relationships than the very creator God who created us to be in relationship with him. So how in the world do we navigate this? This is the verses we're going to start with every week through this series because Jesus teaches us how to be in right relationships. The religious leaders come to him and they try to test him and they say, hey, what's the greatest commandment since you know everything? Since you say you're the son of God, and if you've got your Bible, go ahead and get to Matthew 22, verse 37 to 39. That's where we're going to be every week to start, and it's going to come as no surprise whether you've been in church or you've been hanging out with us these past few weeks. It's no coincidence that we're in relationships when we just came off a solid foundation of prayer. So if you've got your Bible, Matthew 22, verse 37 to 39, if not, as always, they're free in the garden. You can follow along with us, as Alex shared earlier, in our Vine Church app. You're going to see a notes tab in there. You can do that. But as always, uh, we can always thank our Vine production team to make sure wherever you're watching around the world throughout the week, it's going to be on the screen. You with me? Give me an amen. 
I hear amen in the house of the Lord. So let's go. Matthew 22, verse 37 to 39, and it says this. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is giving us the key to having right relationships, to being great relationships, to not be divided, but to be reconciled, to live a fulfilling and purposeful life and meaningful life is to be right in right relationship with God vertically, and that's through Christ alone, but also horizontally with each other being right relationship. And that's so funny because the cross has a vertical beam and a horizontal beam, and that's what Jesus did to reconcile us. But you see, Jesus knew everything that we knew. He came in human skin. He knows how frustrating it can be when people don't listen to him. He, walk, he walked around with 12 of them that would never listen to him until he, rode again, until he rose again. His own brother, when he was doing his earthly ministry, said, you're crazy. If we go back and read Mary, when Jesus turns the water and wine, what in John 2, even he looks at her and says, it's not my time yet. And she's like, hey, I know who you are. I gave birth to you. I, I brought you into the world. I'll take you out. And he just laughed. She didn't say that, but let's be honest. When we look at this, Jesus understands the hardest part about being in right relationships is people. Is it not? If the other people would just listen, if they would just do what I want them to do. Yet in this world we live in, how deep are our relationships? See, technology gives us a superficial relationship, right? We have to take 15 pictures to get the right one, right? It's got to be perfect. That used to happen for Christmas cards. Like, honestly, like you had to take multiple shots, and you didn't know, and, and, and you prayed that Walgreens wouldn't ruin your film, like, because somebody light shocked your photo, uh, but Walgreens didn't, because, you know, I was part of it, so we didn't. However, that being said, there are a couple of us here at the Vine that love the Lord that were part of that. Our worship leader, Alyssa, knows. Anyway, wherever we are, we didn't light shock your film. We were ready to go. We made sure that it worked, and it was great. But now we do it just to post something online. And see, my fear is we love AI. AI has so much potential, but here's what we're going to do with AI. We're going to try to replace real relationships with a computer. And why are we going to do that? Because we have the illusion of control. We think we can control the input, right? We're always taught in school, garbage in, garbage out when it comes to a computer. So we think, well, if I can control the person on the other side of my relationship, then it will be fulfilling. But Jesus just taught us it's not about control. It's actually about letting go and loving them. And so that's what we have to understand when we have to have right relationship. So we're going to kick this off, and why in the world are we going here today? Because right now, I'm, I'm praying that I can temper it down a little bit because I, I, I'm really I'm excited for what Jesus is going to do, but I see this as our moment, church. Jesus has created us for a time such as this. In the midst of dysfunction, in the midst of division, we get to be his hands and feet. We get to show the world the greatest thing ever, which is his love. And so as we do that, our world is caught up in the dysfunction of relationships, the comfortable dysfunction. Is it easier to stay mad at that person? Or is it easier to reconcile with them? We talked about forgiveness. It's much easier to not forgive them. You know why? Because I don't have to grow in the Lord, and I don't have to take a next step in the Lord if, that, if they didn't. Did you see what they did to me? They ran that red light. Did you see what they did to me? If you knew how they hurt me, if you knew how they did that to me, yet Jesus says there's a better way. And so for us, I want us to think about that. I've shared this before, most of the time growing up for me, it was the function of relationships, understanding that and seeing the dynamic of that. If you know anything about me, listen, I've been blessed in my life, but most of the time I, I try to make my yes be yes and my no be no. As we heard last week, no is a lot. It's been in my vocabulary for a long, long time. So much so that mom and dad had to get a shirt that said no. All the way through for me. Yet, in my life, it's because I could get it done. Because if I said I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I relied on me. Now, as you get older, what does that mean for you? I'm going on 85 right now. And uh, as you get older, you realize, yes, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, but it took 20 years of greasing for you to go downhill to get it going. And you ain't got many more wheels you can get going. You can only do what you've got. 
And so when I say that, what I would say is we look at the dysfunction and the function of relationships. I, let me ask you this. If you go outside today and you want to understand the function of something, know the difference between an e-brake and a hood latch, don't call me. But that being said, what if you didn't understand the function of your car for real? If you treated the gas pedal or the accelerator as the brake and the brake as the accelerator, would you say there'd be a problem? Let me ask you this. Would it just affect you? Could it harm not only you but others? Because it's not operating in its right function. And that's why Jesus gave us this mold to be in right relationships, to love God and love others, to understand the function of it. Because the devil has kept us comfortable in the dysfunction of it from the beginning, from the garden. Remember Genesis 3, he goes to Eve and says, surely God won't kill you. You're his prized creation. He's not going to, nah, you just got to take a little bit. Of, he's not going to be mad at you. He's going to be mad because you're going to be like he is. So he's just jealous of you. So Satan has kept us this way. So how in the world can we walk through breaking that today? We're going to walk through some questions in a minute, but I always go to the cross. Did Jesus come to be comfortable? See, it's fun to be comfortable. He was com I'm sure he was comfortable in heaven at the right hand of God from the creation, wouldn't you say? It could have been really easy. Let me ask you this. When it comes to relationship, could Jesus have done what he came to do without having one relationship down here? And the answer is yes. He didn't need the 12 disciples. He still could have accomplished God's mission that way. But instead, he chose, chose even one who would betray him with a kiss. That's why, you know, your boy don't want no kisses after the service. You know what I'm saying? The only kiss I want is a hug and kiss from Hershey over there in a moment. I don't want any of that. <laughs> But for real, all the way through, Jesus still chose to model that because Satan will keep us caught in that dysfunction. I think Jesus knew that for us that we often say fear and faith are, are at odds with each other, right? See, I would say that comfort is more of an adversary of faith. Because faith requires you to be uncomfortable. Faith requires you to take next steps. Faith requires you to love your neighbor as yourself. So really quick, before we go into these questions, what are some dysfun what is really the two main dysfunction of broken relationships? And it's really this simple. Whether you're a single, whether you're married, whether you're in friendship or coworker, here's what this means for us. It means the dysfunction of a broken relationship means that I try to give something to someone who God didn't create to receive it, or I tried to receive something from someone who God didn't create to give it to me. The path to hell is paved with what? Good intentions, right? What did the prophet Travis Tritt say? I had the best of intentions from the start, right? See, good intentions can actually leave us broken, busted up, heartbroken, and not only hurting ourselves, but others. And so for us today, may we not be caught in that dis function. May we be intentional with our relationships, because that's what these questions are about. How many of us, I, I talk about it all the time, I'm not going to go through it, I'll do it again today, but we have our favorite rom-com, right? Do they even make those anymore? Maybe? I don't know. Came from the era of that. Tough crowd, nobody watches movies. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, that being said, what I say from that is, okay, the Hallmark movie, here we go. They met by chance, right? They met the city slicker and the country girl met by chance at a music festival, and I hate you, and I hate you. Oh, my God, why am I sitting next to you? I hope I never see you again. You stink. No, you stink. No, I, no, I love you. I love you, too. Oh, my God, let's have children. And there you go. They live in the Biltmore Estate. It's over, right? All the way through. So even each and every one of us, I want us to think about this. How many of our relationships were by chance? First meeting might have been. The only reason we still have our relationships is we're intentional with them, right? Think about the most influential people in your life. Maybe it was that teacher who saw something in you no one else could. Maybe it was a coach who pushed you to go deeper than you ever thought you could and pulled something out of you. Maybe it's that friend. Maybe it's that coworker. Maybe it's that person at church that said, hey, I know the Lord has this for you. Keep going. Keep running the race. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. I want you to think about those people. How intentional are they with you? Maybe you need to reach out to them today and tell them how thankful you are for them. I think that that's always something that is, just brings cheer and joy to our heart. 
But now I want to ask you something else. You might be able to answer this, so I don't want to kind of put you on the spot. Who were the last three Artist of the Year winners? The last three Super Bowl winners. The last three Daytona 500 winners. Don't worry, they'll, they'll run it sometime in July because it rains all the time in February, wherever it is. Who are the last three state representatives for our district in the upstate of South Carolina? I don't know them. Why? Because there's no intentionality in that relationship. They couldn't pick us out of a lineup. <laughs> Neither could we probably pick them, even if they deserve to be in one. I'll move on. That being said, wherever you are right now, let's think about that, and let's talk about the best relationships that we have in God's design. So we're going to ask some questions, and the questions we're going to ask today, I don't have a goal of you breaking off relationships or you ending relationships. My goal today is for all of us to go out and not just look for that person, but actually be that person. So if you're with me, let's get to Philippians chapter 2 really quickly, and then we're going to go in the second place you can mark in your Bible. is Hebrews chapter 12. Not going to be a surprise where we end there. So Philippians chapter 2 verse 19 is where we're going to go, and this is the first question we're going to answer as we go there, and it is this. Is this relationship partnering with Christ to build his kingdom? Is this relationship partnering with Christ to build his kingdom? That's the first question we have to ask, and we're going to see how Paul and Timothy have this relationship that they are. So Philippians 2, verse 19, this is Paul writing about Timothy, and he says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. Now, Paul and Timothy, if you know, Timothy is Paul's protege, all right? Timothy is mentioned about 24, 25 times, I think it's 24 it might be 25, forgive me if that's wrong, but 24 times in the New Testament. So Timothy, his mother is Jewish. His father's a Greek non-believer, all right? So Paul meets Timothy on his first missionary journey to Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And so Timothy gives his life to the Lord, and he starts serving with Paul. Now, Paul, Paul is raising Timothy up to take over for him. So much so, you can see their relationship so strong. Second Timothy's the last letter Paul writes on his deathbed, and when his pen falls silent in Second Timothy, that is when he is gone. That'd be executed, right? Like he's done. So for all of us, we got to understand when it comes to that, Paul sends Timothy to Thessalonica, he sends him to Corinth, and he sends him to Macedonia, if I remember right, uh, in there. But now Paul is writing to Philippi, and it's a place 800 miles away. And he says, I'm sending you someone I trust. I'm sending you someone that's a partner in building the kingdom with me. Now, why do you think Paul has that message? Because if he said, hey, I'm just going to send you this dude. He don't know much about anything, but I'm going to send him your way. How would that feel as a new church plan? How would the people in the church react to that relationship? So now Paul is now giving credence. He's giving credit. He's saying, hey, this relationship is built upon the great commission. So here's my question. For our relationships, what's the thing uniting our relationship? What mission do we live on? Now, hear me out. I'm not telling you we can't have friendships with non-believers, because we should, because someone had to friend us, right? Someone loved us enough to be friends with us to point us to the love of Christ. But I do want to ask you this question when it comes to that. Is there a difference in friendships and relationships? Because there should be. What is it that your parents said? You show me your friends, I'll show you your what? Your future. Why? Because we tend to let friends influence us more than the relationships that we hold dear, right? That's a big difference. So we can have friends who are not Christians in our lives, but the influence that they have upon us should not be greater than the influence of Christ we have upon them. And that's a big one. Because let me tell you, sometimes the worst people to be around are church people. Anyway, I'm probably one of them. But all the way through, that's sometimes the worst influence we can have. So when it comes to that relationship, are we united in partnering with Christ to build his kingdom? Now, you look at that, res that relationship you have. Now, what direction is it going? Is it going toward Christ and building his kingdom, or is it staying still? Because a thriving relationship should be going towards Christ's mission. Because if it is, it should lead us to this second question that we're going to unpack here in Philippians 2 is, is this relationship centered on Christ? 
What is the center of this relationship? What is this relationship all about? Is it about us? Is it about money? Is it about things? Is it about a career? Is it about selfishness? What is this relationship centered on? And so Paul writes about Timothy and how he has put his center of his relationship, his center of his life being Christ in verse 20 and 21 of Philippians 2. And it says this, I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone who looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. So what set Timothy apart? He's a servant leader. And verse 20 there, what's great, there's something he says. We're going to say this word. It's a Greek word. Are you ready? Aesop sukas. So say it with me. Aesop sukas. Aesop sukas. Aesop sukas. Aesop sukas. When it says there is no one like him, it says Aesop sukas. It's only mentioned twice in the New Testament. Second Peter talks about it. It means you are like one soul. You are like one mind. You are knit together. If you go in the Old Testament, it's David and Jonathan's relationship. They are united. They are centered in Christ. Now, if you didn't know that, remember, Jonathan should have been the rightful king of of Israel, but instead David was anointed king. So now all of a sudden you see this friendship. That's the friendship Paul is talking about. So I want you to think about this when it comes to centering on your life. In this world of tribalism, don't you naturally unite to people who like the same things you like? Y'all come in here wearing Florida Gator stuff. I mean, I'm going to love you. It's going to be hard. I mean, it's just going to be hard. Y'all know about me. Like, it is what it is. It's going to be hard, you know? Go Knowles, right? It is what it is. I'll go to the transfer porter and get all of them. Anyway, we won't open that up. All that to say, though, for all of us, it's just how we roll. We tend to do that. But the one thing that should unite us more than anything is Christ. That's why church is so important. Because you're with people who are united in Christ. You even have people who don't know who Jesus is that are going to show up to see how united you, we are in Christ and see it. They're going to say, hey, what, what's going on here? I want to be a part of that. Because why 61% of people say having great friendships are part of meaningful life? We want to belong, don't we? Isn't that wired in us to belong? I mean, that's what happens, right? Like, all of a sudden, Frankenstein's born, and they come with the picks, forts, and fire bad, right? Like, the people united in a frenzy. In the Acts 2 church, that's what they did. They united, and the church spread. So I want us to think about that when it comes to our relationships, Are they centered on Christ? Because here's the thing about the body of Christ. Paul writes it in 1 Corinthians 12 and in Romans 12, if you think about it. The thing about the body in Christ is we belong together, don't we? Y'all are hearing Mariah Carey in your head. We're in church. Calm down. It is what it is. We know what it is, okay? We belong together. This is what we belong together means. I need you to be all God created me to be. And guess what? You need me to be all God created you to be. We ain't got to like it. But that's the way that we're created. And you say, how in the world can I need that person? Well, that's where we got to understand the function of relationships. Yes, I might be able to spend 15, I might be able to juggle 15 things at once, but that's not what God created us for. He created us to use the gifts that he's given us, to be the body, to lift each other up, to rely on each other. Because if we're not doing that, are we really growing? Jesus isn't the center if that's it. Comfort is the center if that's it. And that's not what Jesus came to die and uh, he died and rose again for us to have. So let's think about this. When Paul says, I have no one else like him, this Isopsuchus, that is Timothy, who will show what genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. So what is Paul saying? Timothy ain't speaking no Christianese. He didn't talk about reading his Bible all week. He didn't talk about everything's fine, it's going to be well. There's nothing wrong with those people that are that way, and they have the joy of the Lord all the time. I don't. I think my, the reason I don't, have a, I don't like stray cats is probably half the time I'm like a cat. Womp, womp. Like, you know, that just sometimes it's that way where a dog, man, a dog's got some joy. They're happy to see you all the time. See, Paul is saying that that Timothy, he is being real in his walk with Christ. I'm going to butcher this, and it's okay. You can look it up later. Can y'all forgive me beforehand? I heard a pastor say it this time, and when you know, you know, you're going to lose control. It's okay. Going to church every Sunday makes you no more a Christian than standing in the middle of your garage makes you a car. You know who said that? Carmen. Come on, addicted to Jesus, riot, Satan, bite the dust. 
We didn't grow up in church. It's all right. Look it up later. You'll think that is great. But Carmen said that all the way through. If you remember those days, he said that. It, it's an old school thing. If you don't know, it's good stuff. The riot tour, any, whatever. You can look it up. You'll laugh. And, you, and Toby Mac will never talk to you about that because DR, uh, anyway, what, what, anyway. All the way through when we talk about this, we have to think about not just speaking Christianese, but being it. And that's how we love. That's what Paul is saying. We love others the way Christ loved us. We have moved from now knowing of who Jesus is and instead stepping into the wisdom of it. So let's, let's think about this. That can only happen if it's centered on Christ. And this is where I want to say, in this world of division, We care more about who the president of the United States is, and I'm just going to be honest with you. When I go to heaven, Peter ain't going to ask me that. He ain't going to give a rat's, for lack of a better term, who the president was. He's not going to ask me the right doctrine of the Trinity, as I've heard it said. He's not going to ask me if I'm hermeneutically correct. Hey, here it is. The world we live in right now, we are more caught up in a response to a wedding invitation and how much somebody spent on a Super Bowl ad and who's washing whose feet than we are people dying going to hell. And that breaks my heart. Because here's the thing. If it's wrong biblically by Scripture, should it be addressed? Yes, But shouldn't that be addressed behind closed doors first instead of trying to make a splash and a wave and a name for yourself? Because that's not a life centered on Christ. That's a life centered on my following. And so what does the world see? If we're that judgmental about Christians who spend money, what do you think they're going to expect when we come in here? And what do we tell them? Give. Trust Jesus in giving. Who wants to give to that? We should be angry. Listen, today, this is what breaks my heart. I will tell you, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that old. By God's grace, I get to be, I just turned 40, right? Like, by God's grace. One of the things, praise Jesus, thank you. Praise Jesus' name. One of the things that keeps me up at night, and even though I can't save anyone, is that Jesus put somebody in my path, and I wasn't his love to them, and they die and go to hell without knowing his saving grace. That should break your heart. They don't care. They don't care what the Super Bowl ad was. Don't kick us off YouTube. But they don't care. They don't care about a response to a wedding invitation. They don't care whether we are. They don't care whether we understand transubstantiation, whether we believe in that. They don't care about any of that. They need the hope of Jesus. And that's what we should be around. And the only way we can have that in our relationships is if Jesus is the center of our life, which will make him the center of our relationship. Because if I recall, even the demons knew who Jesus was, right? You remember in his earthly ministry, he cast them out and it says, Oh, most high son of God, don't, what are you doing here? And he said, shut up. It's not my time yet. Shut up as he cast them out. You said, well, that ended with Jesus. Well, read the book of Acts. Because in the book of Acts, I don't know if you remember, people were invoking the name of Jesus and didn't have him as the center of their life. They didn't trust him as their Lord and Savior. And they tried to cast a demon out of a guy. And the demon looks at him and says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but you I don't. And he beats the tar out of them. Like he beats the tar out of the whole mob. Read that in Acts. See, that's living a life not centered on Jesus. That's saying, I'm going to cast something out in Jesus' name for my glory instead of his glory. See, we can't do that if Jesus is the center of our relationship. For us, I just want us to think about that friend. When it hits the fan, you know, that 3 a.m. phone call. You got those in your life. I do. Let's get the wood chipper and go to the pig farm. Like, you know. Think about it. Pray hard. Is that relationship centered on Christ, though? For real. Is it? And if it's not, can you reorient to it? Because that's the only way that we have our living our best life and have our best relationships. And that'll lead to the third question we have. Is this relationship growing us to be all Christ, who Christ created us to be? Excuse me. Is this relationship growing us to be who Christ created us to be? Now, this is true in any relationship. If you're a single person, this is perfect for dating. You have to look at this relationship you have. If you're married, this is a great way to refocus. If you're not in any relationship you have, you can see and answer these questions because Paul is trying to unpack it when it comes to Timothy, and he, he, he kind of finishes it well here in verse 22, and he says this. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me and the work of the gospel. So now he is bringing it all back around. He's saying, hey, Timothy is a partner in building Christ's kingdom. His life is centered on Christ because he's a servant leader. 
and he is growing to be all Christ created him to be. Those of us that know the Lord, let me ask you this. Do you remember when you first met the Lord? Seriously, knew him as Lord and Savior. You remember how on fire you were? Isn't it crazy and weird that as we pilgrim on our journey toward heaven, we like to put a governor on that zeal for some reason. We have to temper it down just a little bit. I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. And I don't know why outside of comfort. Because we know that our eternity is secure. And if that's the case, then what are we doing here? If that's all that Jesus saved us from, why aren't we in heaven right now? Instead, he lets us partner in his work. He lets us be sanctified by the Holy Spirit and grow to be who he created us to be. And that's what Paul is alluding to here. He's saying, hey, Timothy's not just a baby Christian. He's growing in wisdom. So now that you know that, depending on where you, when you met the Lord, okay, hear me out. How easy was it to volunteer and serve when you met the Lord versus knowing the Lord for a long time? Man, I will tell you, you're the first one to raise your hand, right? You're so on fire. I'm ready to share the hope of Jesus everywhere. And I'm coming around. I'm like, hey, man, how's it going, dude? <laughs> Welcome. To, have you had your, you've had too much coffee. Calm down, dude. I got stuff to do, right? Yet oftentimes because new Christians and baby Christians who have no roots raise their hands first. They don't have deep roots in the Lord. They burn out faster because they don't have deep roots. They haven't grown in the wisdom of the Lord. They haven't been able to mature in the faith. And that's what Paul is saying is, hey, Timothy has matured in the faith and continuing mature. That's why I'm sending him to you as an example of how to live. And so for us in that relationship, is this relationship growing us to be all God created us to be? I'm not saying that new Christians can't be in leadership or they can't do things. That's absolutely crazy to say that because I'm not. But I am saying sometimes what God has given us in the church is for us 100% to be together. And as we are together, we will grow to be all Christ created us to be. So for us, let me ask you about your relationship. Are you becoming who Christ created you to be in this relationship that you're in? Is this relationship in God's design for it to be all Christ created it to be? See, what I'm trying to tell you today before we get to Hebrews 12 is I'm not telling you to break your relationships. I'm not telling you what your next step in that relationship is. But I am asking, and I believe the Holy Spirit is showing us today that we have this opportunity and moment to reorient this relationship back to what Christ intended. And if we did that, how much greater, how much, how much peace could be in our schools? How much teachers not having to go to school worrying if kids are going to beat the crap out of them every day because they don't know what discipline is? How many times could we go to the grocery store and not worried about getting robbed in the parking lot? How many times could we go to church on a Sunday and know, oh gosh, there comes the old church curmudgeon person. Like how much peace could we really walk in in the Lord and share his love if we did that? But what about those relationships? What if, what, if you can answer yes to all those questions and you're, you're doing that in the Lord, praise Jesus. Thank Jesus for that relationship. You need to give that person a Hershey hug and kiss today. If they're your spouse, maybe it can be more. But that, other than that, there's none. Make sure you get that. But if not, let's look to what the writer of Hebrews tells us we can do as we reorient it to Christ. So if you got your Bible, let's get to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, and we'll be ready to wrap it up here in just a moment in the name of the Lord. So Hebrews 12 won't be a surprise when I read to you, if you've been at church at all, what we are called to do. And it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd, uh, cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so, uneasily, that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Anything that's not of Christ in that relationship, shed it. Get rid of it. Doesn't belong in it so that you both can run the race that Christ has you on. I'm not telling you today's the day you need to break up with that person. Today's the day. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to do there. But I will say, if Christ is not the center of it, it definitely can't be a part of building his kingdom to make you and that person be all God created you to be. So we are to shed it. 
Have you ever had to carry something extra? Like piggyback rides are the best, right? If you're not the one giving them. Right? Isn't it fun? Like if I want the piggyback ride, pardon me, but we, I have to say it the right way. I want to carry a little person, right? <laughs> I want to be able to do that. That's the fun. I don't want to, if I'm the horse having to carry me, I don't want, you don't want me riding the mini horse that I'm trying to keep up with, right? Like, I need, the, I need the normal riding horse. We need to be able to do that. So this is what I'm saying when it comes to that. What's weighing you down is dysfunction. What's weighing you down is anything that is of Christ. And sometimes we think that's the devil prompting us to get rid of that, but it's actually Jesus. Saying this ain't supposed to be in this relationship. And that's in any relationship. It's Jesus saying, I've got better for you. This race I've marked out for you, and the better for you may not be breaking up with that person. It's reorienting it back to Christ. It's, uh, hey, uh, you're you're, you're not doing business the way you should with that person. It's not a good thing. You're 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 not loving each other the way Christ called you to love you. You're not honoring one another. Instead, you're using one another for your own gain. Reorient it to Christ today. Because the worst and most broken relationship we all have is a relationship in the dysfunction of sin, is it not? See, all of us were made to be in perfect relationship until this thing called sin entered in. And so all of us, you've heard me say these past few weeks, and this is why I've said it will, sin is anything that is against the will of God. And what does that mean? Sin is anything that isn't perfect. Because the will of God is perfect. And I don't know about you, I know I'm as close to perfect as you'll ever meet, right? Right? pride, y'all. You should laugh, but honestly, nothing is perfect. So what if the requirement to be in relationship with Creator God, what you and I were created to do, required perfection? Could you or I get it? Billy Graham himself couldn't get it. None of us could attain this perfection, and the reason is we chose to go against God's will. We said, hey, I love the dysfunction of sin and the comfort of sin better than meeting God in the cool of the day, knowing everything about me. And so because of that, all the way in Genesis 3, all of us, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God and have sinned. And so we have sin in our life, so we could not be perfect. So that would mean our relationship with God could never be, right? So we would aimlessly walk around this life without meaning, without purpose, without even having life. Because you know what the the price of that dysfunction was? Death. Death. Division from God led us to death because of sin. To the brokenness, God said, hey, I love you enough. I'm not going to leave you that way. I'm actually going to come to you, and I'm going to confront this dysfunction. As a matter of fact, I'm going to defeat it. And he goes and does for us what we can't do for ourselves, right? He lives a perfect, sinless life we couldn't live. Now, all of a sudden, we have a way to open the door into a relationship with the Lord. Then he pays the penalty for our sin, which is God's wrath. It is death. On the cross, we don't have to worry about whether we have to bring a peace offering, a friendship offering. Uh, I ran the red light offering. I did that at the red light, and I should have, Lord, I shouldn't have pulled into the hot and now at the Krispy Kreme offering. Now we've got one eternal sacrifice that is in Christ Jesus forever. So now we can sit at God's table, but not only now can we walk in the door and sit at God's table because we're clothed in Christ and his perfection. Jesus said, hey, I'm going to rise again on the third day. Leave an empty tomb so that you can live this life now. You don't have to wait for eternity to do it. You can be in relationship with God now, have a conversation with him, and be all that he created you to be. And the one way that this is achieved is one word, love. Love. We started in Matthew 22. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. See, John 3, 16 and 17 reminds us of this love for God, and it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life or everlasting life. But here's the thing. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In other words, God's love is so great for us, he's not mad at you that you aren't perfect. He's ready to give you a hug. He's ready to welcome you in, but you have to have the faith to trust that he alone can save you. And so the reason we do what we do every day is so that we can be not only living a life centered on Jesus, we can share, share Jesus with everyone in our past. So maybe today you're looking at all of your relationships and you're saying, man, I'm not living a relationship that's centered on Jesus. 
And today is an opportunity for you to receive this free gift of salvation that Jesus has given us. Not that you could earn it, not that we could do the right things and say the right words. It's the faith that we believe Jesus is who he says he is, and he is the only way to fix this broken relationship. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, we even pray as a family here at the vine together. We're going to pray a prayer. It's not the words of this prayer. It's the faith of this prayer that saved you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, please repeat these words after me. Dear Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner separated from you. I believe you came, lived the perfect sinless life I couldn't live, died the death I deserve, paying the penalty for my sins on the cross, but loved me enough not to stay dead, but rose again on the third day so that I may have life. Come take over my life, Lord. Teach me to follow you step by step the rest of my life the best way I know how. With every head bowed and every eye closed, whether you're watching online or you're in the house, I'm gonna ask you to do something boldly on the count of three. If for the first time you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have received this relationship that Jesus alone came to give us, I'm gonna ask you to boldly raise your hand on three. One, two, three. If you're in the house and you've given your life to the Lord, will you do that? Online, you may see that there's a a comment that, that, that is saying respond. You may see some raised hands. You can reach out to us, shoot us a message in the app. Uh, You could reach out to us on all the social media. We want to celebrate this decision with you and welcome you into the body of Christ because this is not your finish line. It is your starting block, and we want to get you into a local church near you. And for the rest of us, we can get up. We're about to have this moment of worship. I hope today has been a great reflecting point and a great reorienting point, you know, when all of a sudden you got to turn your location services on on your phone. I hope that's what today has been, where it reorients you to the right place and that Christ is the center. Christ is the reason because Christ made sure that he showed us we were the reason that he came. So would you stand and worship?
It's always been Jesus, right? Always. That's what we get to show the world. Hey, they've been searching for money. They've been searching for a lottery ticket. It's been Jesus. Been searching for a Super Bowl championship. It's Jesus. Been searching for a Daytona 500 win. Good luck. But it's Jesus. Wherever we are, we get to share Jesus. So what if today we went out and said, if we won't tell them, Lord, who will? Let me show them you. Man, oh man, just imagine the stories we'll get to be a part of. Because you know we're going to get to celebrate if they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior in eternity. And man, we're going to tell some good stories. We're going to share some good times. But most importantly, we're going to be molded in the image of Christ. And they're going to remember us for our love, not our hate, our judgment, or our condemnation. We hope you join us next week as we continue our She Said, He Said series. Hit them with the one, two. You know, got to get ready. Calm down. Uh, we're going to have fun with that, and I hope and pray we see your smiling face next week. Everyone in here's smiling face will be here, and the sickness is banished. No scourge or plague for any of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Always remember, the best is still yet to come.